lovely, the very erudite, the very accomplished, and the very lovely Dr. Samita Sain. Dr. Sain received her PhD from Cambridge University in 1992. She won the Trinity College Prize Fellowship earlier in 1990. She taught history at the Calcutta University and women's studies at Jadapur University from 1994 to 2018. She was the first Vice Chancellor, Diamond Harbour Women's University, 2013 to 2015. She was the Dean, Faculty of Interdisciplinary Studies in Jadapur University, 2016 to 2018. She has written Women and Labour in Late Colonial India and so much more. There is so much more to this lady that an entire evening will be required if I want to wrap this up in one go. So I think, let us hear straight from Dr. Sain what she has to say about the issues which she's, uh, which she's mentioned in her books and in her works. The topic for today, Superwoman and the Evolving Social Narratives in that context. That's a fantastic topic and the buzzword is Superwoman. Dr. Sain, if I may be permitted to recite Alicia K, where she said, still, when I am a mess, I still put on a vest with an S on my chest, and oh yes, I'm a superwoman. But my question is, is superwoman a fable that we must adorn as an achievement? Isn't it an adversity to a woman's entire sense of being? Let me begin by contextualizing this term. Yes. So this term, I mean, there is a superwoman from the Superman uh, the, the comic strip context. Yes. Uh, but that is actually not the context in which it became popular. It became popular uh, it, uh, from a 1975 book by Shirley Conran, a British journalist. Yes. Um, wrote this book called Superwoman, which is, I forget the subtitle of the book, but it's basically on household tips, um, everyday management of um, the home. Yes. And immediately, I mean, these two elements that it came out in 1975, and it is about home management, gives you the context of why it became so popular. Um, 1975 is when the second wave feminism has kind of spread already in Europe, particularly in the UK and USA. Mm -hmm. So they are seeking out new ways of making careers, um, new public roles for themselves, activism of various sorts. And at the same time, they also have not yet their um, old feminine roles. Oh, yes. As homemakers and mothers and childcare. Yes. So the superwoman idea is a woman who is able to perform the old, the traditional feminine roles along the new feminine roles. Traditional and modern at the same time, you're feminine and feminist at the same time, you do home and you know public at the same time. And it is this jugglery which in the Indian context we have often used the image of the Durga with the yes. uh, to represent this, this phenomena. Uh, yes. that one who's able to do everything and everything mm. relatively well. <laughs> You know, it is that context in which the, the idea of superwoman emerged. Um, that it is, uh, you know, that it is extremely burdensome for women. There is no doubt, obviously. You have to be, be all of these things all at once. Is a demand only made of women. It is often said, for instance, women who are making careers, it is often said of them that they have to do, they have to be twice as good as men uh, to be able to do as well as men. So our problem is that we are always serving somebody else's interests. Be in terms of motherhood, be in terms of marriage, even having a job versus a career. 
are two different terms there right so we create stress for our, ourselves a lot of stress for ourselves and i believe that we also get stuck in a perfection trap dr sohan and we end up creating stress for other people also because we fail to delegate duties and responsibilities we feel in that household the other person will not be able to do such great a job as we can isn't it um i will um, um bring that um, that that comment you made to a broader perspective so when in 1975 conran is writing superwoman ah uh, she is writing in a uk in a britain in a post in post war britain which has actually seen the gradual disappearance of domestic worker she is advising women in household management the assumption there are two things that have happened one is the domestic worker has vanished and on the other hand they are getting new and newer and newer technologies contrast here is you know enormous in terms of the indian uh, context okay the middle class women who have made who have been the primary subjects of feminist change who have uh, the women have gone in jobs in such um as try to make careers have had a very different uh home context many of them have had familial support the nuclearization of families as they happened in europe had not yet happened in india so you mothers mothers in law is another kind of family support indian homemakers are actually not they don't they do less of the labor of housework and they approach to housework is more managerial um, huge when you take away the domestic worker what becomes the nature of housework is something many indian families are experiencing and i feel yes i mean we do fail to delegate at times that is also correct in a way but probably in a very nuclear fashion right even within the household within one room we tell our husbands or we tell our children please don't touch that cover i'll put your clothes inside myself when it becomes their work they will do it excellently well we just don't let this become their work we take it upon ourselves the problem is what to say that we are juggling too many balls at the same time and if this okay if sometimes the balls fall if they get dropped it is okay at times but no what happens is that we are beset with this humongous sense of guilt because we are told right from the beginning that work life balance is something which we must achieve we must never take credit for any achievement that we have made generally and then there is this emotional scourging the sense of guilt women are beset with why is that so well i mean that is the um, strongest patriarchal weapon that society yes. has to yes. uh, you know keep our keep us in our place so to speak um and i'll come back to my theme of uh, labor substitution and say that in a sense because we have had domestic workers mm-hmm. there has been no pressure in indian society to rework even though in the 90s we had briefly the metro section it impacted advertisements it impacted public sphere actually in the privacy of our homes i don't know how much effect that had so the idea that the um, housework is the responsibility of the woman uh, has remained even that a woman does a responsible job and that the, the the continuation of that um, 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 stereotype or uh, has been easier work is not demanding they were demanding in terms of labor it is emotionally demanding it is managerial but somebody if if you tell your husband no 
oh my god you have to help me he said but you're not doing it you just have to give the instruction uh, so the, in that sense the gen the problem is when you take the domestic worker away hmm. what happens now as if we know in the lockdown when you take the domestic worker away the dynamics change yeah nothing has changed so this nothing has changed has happened because labor in this interim period labor substitute in a way we have benefited from it we have not had to fight for gender um, uh, 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 the reorientation of gender of labor it's come easily to us um, but on the other hand it has also meant that nothing has changed so all clouds have a silver lining but all silver lining also have a cloud oh, yes <laughs> yes i mean and there is another pressure on women especially from the middle class household that feel that there are these they see these adverts using those promises and hints at the clear complexion the great like silver the super cool mom with ultra ultra super looks and those multi orgasmic divas in the bed right everything feminism is not about everything we are set out to fight so which aliens are we talking about dr say where do these women reside on which planet um well i mean it's not a different planet it's just um there are you know there are uh, less that are different yes the, if you go down the social ladder then the fresh the nature of the pressures on women are not very different the nature is not in so in fact the substance the content may be very different working class work still has the problem of educating them yeah so for her what she has to do to educate the children may be quite different from what a super cool mom has to do how do you feel that it is how is it different from feeling successful to being successful for a woman how many levels of wrongs are there in between that is a very subjective question yes uh, and uh, it relates to the guilt question that you had raised earlier hmm. for many of us for a very large i would say the majority of us mm-hmm. we are not confident in our to judge our own success we see our the eyes of others yes if society thinks to us that you are successful then we will feel successful if you are a super cool mom who is an extremely successful mom hmm maybe in a fact a very successful mom may not feel successful because she is not given the credit for that so how society values measures success it is the message that is given to uh, the individual content by the media environment by larger society um, actually has an impact also say that some women and in our country i have seen many such are strong and confident and very uh, you know clear in their own minds about their own um success and um, whatever that they're very grounded in what they do it's not all women are um fragile i think we should also celebrate that oh yes oh yes we need to there has to be celebration of the real self rather than the labels that we set on them we do should not celebrate the labels that we set on them we should celebrate them the way they are the only sense of achievement shouldn't be that how good you are in office or how good you are at home there are many other levels of good as well which are very personal to a person which are very subjective so we are always aligned to something which is objective which is the world expects of us but not of what we expect from the world for us for us coming back to your body of work dr said like we discussed you know even with the overall poor participation of women in the workplace there are certain occupations and certain sectors where women share a higher or a lower 
uh, uh, workplace, right? Or women from a certain section of population are born, right? For example, in teaching these days, or in the in the nursing sector, and many other, even as household heads. So, do the social and economic factors determine a woman's activity into the paid work work sphere? Um, well, uh, uh, two um, uh, objective um, facts uh, shape that question, shape the answer to that question. Um, first is that India is one of those countries which actually has historically a very low workforce participation rate of women. Of women. Yes, yes. Um, and it is, in fact, in the 21st century, we have seen in the last a couple of decades a decrease rather than an increase. Starting from the colonial period when we modernization, revolution of our industry, our industrial capitalism. Um, Interesting aspects. So, so a backward, what would be seen as a backward or a traditional feature? Men and women inhabited different separate social spaces. Yes. And they were constrained to continue to inhabit this, to remain separated in terms of social space. We define as gender segregation. Oh, yes. Um, so that actually was a major, has been a major constraint to women uh, participation in work because once work became public, women could follow the work into the public sphere. In order for segregation to continue, mm -hmm. services required by women has to be given by, by women. Okay. If you want women students, then you need women teachers. If you have women patients, then you need women doctors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so certain kinds of, um, uh, in, in Europe, for instance, there was no need for women doctors for women patients. Male doctors would doctor women patients. Mm -hmm. In fact, that, in fact, it's the opposite that happened. Women healers gave way to male doctors. Mm -hmm. Even for female patients. But in country we had actually so very early this was in Calcutta. Puli and Chandra Mukti Basu passed the big exam. Kadamini Ganguly went on to become a doctor. Kadamini Ganguly passed her medicine exam. She and she, all she then married, she got Edinburgh, got another degree, and she practiced as a doctor her entire life. And we are talking about the late 19th century. This was possible because elite women of that time want the service of a woman doctor. So female, so the question you asked me, female profession, in fact, even British doctors, mm -hmm. European doctors came to practice in India because they found India a more hospitable place in which to practice medicine. As women. Okay, okay, that's a revelation. Special demand for women professionals in a gender segregated society. As women gravitating towards? Yes, so this is something, a little historical nugget that I think we should keep at the stage. In you know, uh, consequences, unintended consequences of. of of something that you know is otherwise not a very good thing yes yes because even after independence in 1947 in india there was a development towards the working class which became the primary focus at that point because the country had to progress right into conditions of and uh, there were a whole lot of conditions which were pointing towards the industrial labor but india still didn't see as many women Indian women coming up into the workforce as they do today. So that has taken its own time. Okay. Why is so late in coming, Dr. Say? Why so, so late in coming? That is actually, that, is, that was my first uh, research. I uh, my first, uh, my, PA, oh, my PhD research was on women's participation in the jute industry in Bengal. Yes. yes. And uh, 
uh, the 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 uh, answer to your question is early marriage. Some kinds of industries, early mm -hmm. like textile industry, mm -hmm. has employed women. Mm -hmm. Who are the kind of women who work? Say China, many countries, China, Japan, countries in Europe, USA. Um, textile industries have employed women. And a few of these people may re workforce at a later stage in their life because, because their husbands are unemployed or because they are widowed. Because the age of marriage was so low, about 7 to 11. There is no, then there is no unmarried women who can work in industry. It's yes. By the age of 10. Then who is going to work in industry? There's no yes. unmarried women working. So the women who could enter industry were only those women who had either after marriage for whatever reason, um, either through widowhood or divorce, very different kind of uh, female labor. The Bombay textile industry, which has the largest uh, about 25 percent, there's never been a preponderance of women. So that explains partly the low workforce participation rate. Yes, very, very well explained, very articulate, Dr. Say. Coming back to your next body of work, when we are talking about the problems which beset working women. There, we don't fail to observe that there's a problem of trafficking also of women, which is addressed with reference to history of their work and migration, with a focus on Bengal quite a bit, and also from the colonial era right till today. So, what are your views on that? What are your observations on that? Um, you have asked a vast question which has to do with a lot of my work so I'm going to have to try and you know do this in a as briefly as I can. Um, so I'll start by saying that the question of migration and trafficking are very closely related. Yes. Um, so a lot of uh, um, the, the question of trafficking of women has obviously always been there in terms of slavery. And slavery has a very old you know, um, 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 presence in South Asia. Um, but very specifically in terms of uh, work, uh, the question of trafficking stroke migration became controversial. Emigration of indentured to plantation colonies across the world. In this body of, um, in this kinds of, in these channels of migration, goes away to a different land, to a plantation for a period of time. The question then is, does a woman have the right to make that choice? Okay. Women have the right to say, I'm going, I'm, I've got a job, I'm going. Yeah. 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 Now this woman can be a wife, a mother, uh, uh, or none of these uh, widows, or a childless widow. But it is very true concept in 19th century India of an individual woman not embedded in the family. So whoever, whatever this identity of the, whatever the identity of this woman, wife, mother, or a childless widow, the idea that a woman can decide of her own opportunity to wage is a choice. So it's like patriarchy and capitalism. This is an incredible example of how patriarchy and capitalism are opposed. The whole thing of profiting becomes very, uh, 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 a huge rhetoric. Because then how do you explain, how do you tackle with this? That women cannot, do not, cannot, uh, leave of their own choice, they are taken. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah? Somebody takes them. So you erase women's agency from migration. And if you erase women's agency, Migration, what do you get? You get traffic. 
Yes. So what then happens is that migrant um, a recruitment for plantation wage labor. Mm -hmm. um, Wage labor that is not free because wage plantation wage labor is unfree. Markets for marriage, that marriage is also not free. So once you're married, you can't. Uh, so the what colonial um, state did in the 19th century is to, especially a Hindu marriage, they created a situation in which exit from a Hindu marriage by a woman uh, became very, very difficult. Where you have these proximate markets. Entry, exit, both are not free. Yes. Se sexual labor, prostitution. No, even, even uh, certainly, if you, if you see, Dr. Sain, if you ask what freedom is, freedom is the choice to make a choice. Isn't it? The choice that you can, you have some options projected to you. Most of the time, women do not even have options. Even if you see present-day households in certain middle-class and lower-middle-class households, a woman or a girl child, you feel that if a girl child is born, she's born with those host of disadvantages. You can do this. It's like being quarantined for life. You can't do this. You can't touch that. You can't go there. You can't wear these kind of clothes. Look at the cup panchayats or look at so many other traditionalists. Right. Now, what happens to a girl? It's not as if not being able to what she wanted to do, but also the feeling of being inadequate, the feeling, the inherent sense that she will never be able to make a choice, the right choice for herself, because all along somebody else has been making those choices for her. And that is where, you know, sometimes she bows down to these kind of traffickings and these kinds of taken aways. Well, I mean, there are two uh, slippery um, um, arguments yeah. around this. So choice is always a very complicated thing. Absolutely. There, is, there can be choice that is um, subjective agency, mm -hmm. but then there are also structural constraints to choice. Mm -hmm. There are legal constraints to choice. So what I'm talking about is ni neither a subjective nor structural. I'm talking about actual legal definitions of concept. Legal indentured labor is defined that there is so there is certain kinds of choice which are determined by social factors which you can make or cannot make. Um, this is what I was saying in the, the in relation to trafficking. So her element of her choice and consent can be erased. Coming back to art and culture and writings and literature, if we come back to that sphere, I'm reminded of something which Buna Muhammad once wrote and she said, superheroes allow their capes to hang off their backs, but a superwoman chooses to wrap them around her heads. This is basically coming from a community or coming from a person's subjective view of what's happened with her. Now, even if you go back to the poems, you know, from the early 19th century, if you, or even to early 20th century, look at Bundele Har Bolo Ke Moon, Hamne Suni Kahani Ki Khoop Ladi Mardani O Jhansi Wali Rani Ki. When Subhadra Kumari Chauhan wrote that, it's a beautiful poem. But then the word Mardani has to come in for women. When it comes to between men and women, and we are talking from the point of view of literature, man. So if you say a woman slogs like a man, you never say a man slogs like a woman at home, right? If you if you say you are, why are you crying? You're crying like a baby, or you're crying like a girl. Ladkiyon ki tarah ro rahe ho, right? Or he looks very effeminate, or you're a mama's boy. It certainly turns out into it. It is a derogatory term for them, right? Yeah. And so when will we when will we escape these traps, these decoys that we have? Or even in Hindi film music, when a woman is singing to a man, and also it was very popular that um, apne mujko raklo, sajan, ki ho. So are we inviting this upon ourselves or the dismal role of woman that my very sense of being 
means that I must rise to the occasion as a man wants it and when a man man wants it. Yes, I would actually complicate that a little bit. Yes. Um, uh, in our country particularly, uh, we have a very strong tradition, um, particularly strong within the bhakti um, um, sects, in which the devotee is imagined as a woman. For a lot of the times, the literary tropes of feminine subject are actually metaphors for religion. That this gender is strongly implicated in our devotional language has actually been in the beginning of the metaphor of subordination often becomes real. Yes. And applies, you know. Uh, so this is something that can only, this is a cultural change. And the most uh, fundamental change will come from like for I mean, you know, uh, it is writing, uh, it is yes. women. Uh, the more we have women entering the as sisters, right. uh, we will have new languages to express women's own um, uh, which is not to say, and I'm, I, I, um, um, but one can't throw the baby out of the bottle. Yes. That some of our greatest classical literature has these very derogatory stereotypes. This Ooh, is yes. very good classical literature. <laughs> and still great to read. Uh, yes. so I wouldn't throw it out because it has the wrong kind of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, we need to create new literature uh, which um, reflects, you know, new values of our of our time. Which is very heartening to know because you know uh, there are writers who are trying to fight between the tradition versus the progress. Look at Margaret Atwood's uh, *Handmaid's Tale*, which highlights the theocracy and the fight against it. Or speak by Laurie Anderson, you know, where the victim speaks up and raises her voice against sexual assault. Or The Color Purple, the book that I'm reading presently by Alice Walker, talks about the black womanhood and the, the stigmas associated with the brown colored society and the well behaved um, Indian woman by Swami and the way. And even when I wrote my latest book, Lost and Found in Banaras, where I was writing about the child widows of Banaras. I ran into this huge argument with my editor and the publisher because I did not want to, I never wanted to project those VP victims. Mm. Why should they be VP victims? It was not their fault and they were girls because there's a time where the 18 year old baby was in love with a boy who's, who's a tourist guide in Banaras and she goes and tells the ashram matria that had my husband, had I died, do you think my husband would have tortured his head and come and live with you in the ashram? I have a right to love, a right to my body, a right to my desires, and a right to life like just about anybody else. So I think when people, uh, I took it upon myself as a responsibility as a writer, because as a writer, we feel that we are having a huge responsibility on our shoulders. There's a generation that is following the writing. And when they follow your writing, they're also following the behavior that they might pick up from there. I understand that books cannot generate new behaviors, but yes, they influence. That what is, do you think, you yes. know, yeah, literature, but the creative art, culture, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, is actually what shapes behavior. Not only novels, but if we put together uh, novels and art and film and theater and music and all that and that is really what shapes social behavior. Ma'am, say anything that you would like to pinpoint especially during this session for us. I will end by saying you said you know that thing about romance cave uh, mm -hmm. around one's um, head. 
Um, today it should be around your nose and mouth. <laughs> Thank you, Ma'am Sain. So winding up this lovely conversation with you where I got to learn so much, so much from what I'd never read about. And I, was, I did my homework on you, but I ended up learning so much while I tete -tete with you. So everybody out there, Women, you are not the girl child born with any host of disadvantages at all. So do not corrode yourself. Do not lend yourself out to anyone or anything that you do not agree with. Be yourself. Mark your own, mark your own line of excellence, your own index of excellence. And we are not just about the Prince Charmings. We are not just about the poison apple. We do not even binge or warriors movie. It is okay to juggle so many balls and it is perfectly okay to let some balls fall. It is perfectly fine. So, thank you, our, prof our Professor Emeritus of today, Dr. Sain. Thank you so much for this conversation and a very insightful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me your story for this wonderful session. We look back to coming back with more with all of you. Bye-bye for now.